chapter one of pioneers of the old south this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org pioneers of the old south by mary johnston chapter one the three ships sail elizabeth of england died in sixteen hundred and three there came to the english throne james stuart king of scotland king now of england and scotland in sixteen hundred and four a treaty of peace ended the long war with spain gone was the sixteenth century here though in childhood was the seventeenth century now that the wars were over old colonization schemes were revived in the english mind of the motives which in the first instance had prompted these schemes some with the passing of time had become weaker some remained quite as strong as before most englishmen and women knew now that spain had clay feet and that rome though she might threaten could not always perform what she threatened to abase the pride of spain to make harbours of refuge for the angel of the reformation these wishes though they had not vanished though no man could know how long the peace with spain would last were less fervid than they had been in the days of drake but the old desire for trade remained as strong as ever it would be a great boon to have english markets in the new world as well as in the old to which merchants might send their wares and from which might be drawn in bulk the raw stuffs that were needed at home the idea of a surplus population persisted england of five million souls still thought that she was crowded and that it would be well to have a land of younger sons a land of promise for all not abundantly provided for at home it were surely well for mere pride's sake to have due lot and part in the great new world and wealth like that which spain had found was a dazzle and a lure why man all their dripping pans are pure gold and all the chains with which they chain up their streets are massy gold all the prisoners they take are fettered in gold and for rubies and diamonds they go forth on holidays and gather em by the seashore so the comedy of eastward ho seen on the london stage in sixteen hundred and five eastward ho because yet they thought of america as on the road around to china in this year captain george weymouth sailed across the sea and spent a summer month in north virginia later new england weymouth had powerful backers and with him sailed old adventurers who had been with raleigh coming home to england with five indians in his company weymouth and his voyage gave to public interest the needed philip towards action here was the peace with spain and here was the new interest in virginia go to said mother england it is time to place our children in the world the old adventurers of the day of sir humphrey gilbert had acted as individuals soon was to come in the idea of cooperative action the idea of the joint stock company acting under the open permission of the crown attended by the interest and favour of numbers of the people and giving to private initiative and personal ambition a public tone some men of foresight would have had crown and country themselves the adventurers superseding any smaller bodies but for the moment the fortunes of virginia were furthered by a group within the great group by a joint stock company a corporation in sixteen hundred had come into being the east india company prototype of many companies to follow now six years later there arose under one royal charter two companies generally known as the london and the plymouth 
the first colony planted by the latter was short-lived its letters patent were for north virginia two ships the mary and john and the gift of god sailed with over a hundred settlers these men reaching the coast of what is now maine built a fort and a church on the banks of the kennebec then followed the usual miseries typical of colonial venture sickness starvation and a freezing winter with the return of summer the enterprise was abandoned the foundation of new england was delayed a while her pilgrims yet in england though meditating that first remove to holland her mayflower only a ship of london port staunch but with no fame above another the london company soon to become the virginia company therefore engages our attention the charter recites that sir thomas gates and sir george somers knights richard hacklett clerk prebendary of westminster edward maria wingfield and other knights gentlemen merchants and adventurers wish to make habitation plantation and to deduce a colony of sundry of our people into that part of america commonly called virginia it covenants with them and gives them for a heritage all america between the thirty-fourth and the forty-first parallels of latitude the thirty-fourth parallel passes through the middle of what is now south carolina the forty-first grazes new york crosses the northern tip of new jersey divides pennsylvania and so westward across to that pacific or south sea that the age thought so near to the atlantic all england might have been placed many times over in what was given to those knights gentlemen merchants and others the king's charter created a great council of virginia sitting in london governing from overhead in the new land itself there should exist a second and lesser council the two councils had authority within the range of virginian matters but the crown retained the power of veto the council in virginia might coin money for trade with the indians expel invaders import settlers punish evil ill-doers levy and collect taxes should have in short dignity and power enough for any colony likewise acting for the whole it might give and take orders to dig mine and search for all manner of mines of gold silver and copper to have and enjoy yielding to us our heirs and successors the fifth part only of all the same gold and silver and the fifteenth part of all the same copper now are we ready it being christmas tide of the year sixteen hundred and six to go to virginia riding on the thames before black wall are three ships small enough in all conscience sake the susan constant the good speed and the discovery the admiral of this fleet is christopher newport an old seaman of raleigh's bartholomew gosnold captains the good speed and john ratcliffe the discovery the three ships have aboard their crews and one hundred and twenty colonists all men the council in virginia is on board but it does not yet know itself as such for the names of its members have been deposited by the superior home council in a sealed box to be opened only on virginia soil the colonists have their paper of instructions they shall find out a safe port in the entrance of a navigable river they shall be prepared against surprise and attack they shall observe whether the river on which you plant doth spring out of mountains or out of lakes if it be out of any lake the passage to the other sea will be the more easy and like enough you shall find some spring which runs the contrary way toward the east india sea they must avoid giving offence to the naturals must choose a healthful place for their houses must guard their shipping 
they are to set down in black and white for the information of the council at home all such matters as directions and distances the nature of soils and forests and the various commodities that they may find and no man is to return from virginia without leave from the council and none is to write home any discouraging letter the instructions end lastly and chiefly the way to prosper and to achieve good success is to make yourselves all of one mind for the good of your country and your own and to serve and fear god the giver of all goodness for every plantation which our heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted out nor did they lack verses to go by as their enterprise itself did not lack poetry michael drayton wrote for them britons you stay too long quickly aboard bestow you and with the merry gale swell your stretch sail with vows as strong as the winds that blow you your course securely steer west and by south forth keep rocks lee shores no shoals where elis scowls you need not fear so absolute the deep and cheerfully at sea success you still entice to get the pearl and gold and ours to hold virginia earth's only paradise and in regions far such heroes bring ye forth as those from whom we came and plant our name under that star not known unto our north see the parting upon thames's side englishmen going english kindred friends and neighbours calling farewell waving hat and scarf standing bareheaded in the grey winter weather to virginia they are going to virginia the sails are made upon the susan constant the good speed and the discovery the last weary carries aboard the last adventurer the anchors are weighed down the river the wind bears the ships toward the sea weather turning against them they taste long delay in the downs but at last are forth upon the atlantic hourly the distance grows between london town and the outgoing folk between english shores and where the surf breaks on the pale virginian beaches far away far away and long ago yet the unseen actual cables hold and yesterday and to-day stand embraced the lips of the thames meet the lips of the james and the breath of england mingles with the breath of america End of chapter one chapter two of pioneers of the old south by mary johnston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the adventurers what was this virginia to which they were bound in the sixteenth and early seventeenth centuries the name stood for a huge stretch of literal running southward from lands of long winters and fur-bearing animals to lands of the canebrake the fig the magnolia the chameleon and the mockingbird the world had been circumnavigated drake had passed up the western coast and yet cartographers the learned and those who took the word from the learned strangely visualized the north american mainland as narrow indeed apparently they conceived it as a kind of extended central america the huge rivers puzzled them there existed a notion that these might be estuaries curling and curving through the land from sea to sea india cathay spices and wonders and orient wealth lay beyond the south sea and the south sea was but a few days march from hatteras or chesapeake the virginia familiar to the mind of the time lay extended and she was very slender her right hand touched the eastern ocean and her left hand touched the western 
contact and experience soon modified this general notion wider knowledge political and economic considerations practical reasons of all kinds drew a different physical form for old virginia before the seventeenth century had passed away they had given to her northern end a baptism of other names to the south she was lopped to make the carolinas only to the west for a long time she seemed to grow while like a mirage the south sea and cathay receded into the distance this narrative moving with the three ships from england and through a time span of less than a hundred and fifty years deals with a region of the western hemisphere a thousand miles in length several hundred in breadth stretching from the florida line to the northern edge of chesapeake bay and from the atlantic to the appalachians out of this virginia there grew in succession the ancient colonies and the modern states of virginia maryland south and north carolina and georgia but for many a year virginia itself was the only settlement and the only name this virginia was a country favored by nature neither too hot nor too cold it was rich soiled and capable of every temperate growth in its sunniest aspect great rivers drained it flowing into a great bay almost a sea many armed as briarius affording safe and sheltered harbors slowly with beauty the land mounted to the west the sun set behind wooded mountains long wave lines raised far back in geologic time the valleys were many and beautiful watered by sliding streams back to the east again below the rolling land were found the shimmering levels the jewel-green marshes the wide slow waters and at last upon the atlantic shore the thunder of the rainbow-tinted surf various and pleasing was the country springs and autumns were long and balmy the sun shone bright there was much blue sky a rich flora and fauna there were mineral wealth and water power and breadth and depth for agriculture such was the virginia between the potomac and the dan the chesapeake and the alleghanies this and not the gold bedight slim neighbor of cathay was now the lure of the susan constant the good speed and the discovery but those aboard obsessed by spanish america imperfectly knowing the features and distances of the orb yet clung to their first vision but they knew there would be forest and indians tales enough had been told of both what has to be imagined is a forest the size of virginia here and there chiefly upon river banks show small indian clearings here and there are natural meadows and toward the salt water great marshes the home of waterfowl but all these are little or naught in the whole faint adornments sewed upon a shaggy garment green in summer flame-hued in autumn brown in winter green and flower-colored in the spring nor was the forest to any appreciable extent like much virginian forest of to-day second growth invaded hewed down and renewed to hear again the sound of the axe set afire by a thousand accidents burning upon its own funeral pyres all its primeval glory withered the forest of old virginia was jocund and powerful eternally young and eternally old the forest was despot in the land was emperor and pope with the forest went the indian they had a pact together the indians hacked out space for their villages of twenty or thirty huts their maize and bean fields and tobacco patches they took saplings for poles and bark 
to cover the huts and wood for fires the forest gave canoe and bow and arrow household bowls and platters the sides of the drum that was beaten at feasts it furnished trees serviceable for shelter when the foe was stalked it was their wall and roof their habitat it was one of the four friends of the indian the ground the waters the sky the forest the forest was everywhere and the indians dwelled in the forest not unnaturally they held that this world was theirs upon the three ships sailing sailing moved a few men who could speak with authority of the forest and of indians christopher newport was upon his first voyage to virginia but he knew the indies and the south american coast he had sailed and had fought under francis drake and bartholomew gosnold had explored both for himself and for raleigh these two could tell others what to look for in their company there was also john smith this gentleman it is true had not wandered fought and companioned with romance in america but he had done so everywhere else he had as yet no experience with indians but he could conceive that rough experiences were rough experiences whether in europe asia africa or america and as he knew there was a family likeness among dangerous happenings so also he found one among remedies and he had a bag full of stories of strange happenings and how they should be met they were going the old long west indies sea road there was time enough for talking wondering considering the past fantastically building up the future meeting in the ship's cabins over ale tankards pacing up and down the small high raised poop decks leaning idle over the side watching the swirling dark blue waters or the stars of night lying idle upon the deck propped by the mast while the trade winds blew and up beyond sail and rigging curved the sky they had time enough indeed to plan for marvels if they could have seen ahead what pictures of things to come they might have beheld rising falling melting one into another certain of the men upon the susan constant the good speed and the discovery stand out clearly etched against the sky christopher newport might be forty years old he had been of raleigh's captains and was chosen a very young man to bring to england from the indies the captured great carac madre de dios laden with fabulous treasure in all newport was destined to make five voyages to virginia carrying supply and aid after that he would pass into the service of the east india company no india java and the persian gulf would be praised by that great company for sagacity energy and good care of his men ten years time from this first virginia voyage and he would die upon his ship the hope before bantam in java bartholomew gosnold the captain of the good speed had sailed with thirty others five years before from dartmouth in a bark named the concord he had not made the usual long sweep southward into tropic waters there to turn and come northward but had gone arrow straight across the north atlantic one of the first english sailors to make the direct passage and save many a weary sea league gosnold and his men had seen cape ann and cape cod and had built upon cuttyhunk among the elizabeth islands a little fort thatched with rushes then hardships thronging and quarrels developing they had filled their ship with sassafras and cedar and sailed for home over the summer atlantic reaching england with not one cake of bread left but only a little vinegar gosnold guiding the good speed is now making his last voyage for he is to die in virginia within the year george percy brother of the earl of northumberland had fought bravely in the low countries he is to stay five years in virginia to serve there a short time as governor and then returning to england is to write a true relation 
in which he begs to differ from john smith's general history finally he goes again to the wars in the low countries serves with distinction and dies unmarried at the age of fifty-two his portrait shows a long rather melancholy face set between a lace collar and thick dark hair a queen and a cardinal mary tudor and reginald pole had stood sponsors for the father of edward maria wingfield this man of an ancient and honourable stock was older than most of his fellow adventurers to virginia he had fought in ireland fought in the low countries had been a prisoner of war now he was presently to become the first president of the first council in the first english colony in america and then miseries increasing and wretched men being quick to impute evil it was to be held with other assertions against him that he was of a catholic family that he travelled without a bible and probably meant to betray virginia to the spaniard he was to be deposed from his presidency returned to england and there right of indication i never turned my face from danger or hid my hands from labour so watchful a sentinel stood myself to myself with john smith he had a bitter quarrel upon the discovery is one who signed himself john radcliffe commonly called and who is named in the london company's list as captain john sycamore alias radcliffe he will have a short and stormy virginian life and in two years be done to death by indians john smith quarrelled with him also a poor counterfeited imposture said smith gabriel archer is a lawyer and first secretary or recorder of the colony short too is his life his name lives in archer's hope on the james river in virginia john smith will have none of him george kendall's life is more nearly spun than radcliffe's or archer's he will be shot for treason and rebellion robert hunt is the chaplain besides those whom the time dubbed gentlemen there are upon the three ships english sailors english labourers six carpenters two bricklayers a blacksmith a tailor a barber a drummer other craftsmen and nondescripts up and down and to and fro they pass in their narrow quarters microscopic upon the bosom of the ocean john smith looms large among them john smith has a mantle of marvellous adventure it seems that he began to make it when he was a boy and for many years worked upon it steadily until it was stiff as cloth of gold and voluminous as a puffed-out summer cloud some think that much of it was such stuff as dreams are made of probably some breadths were the fabric of vision still it seems certain that he did have some kind of an extraordinary coat or mantle the adventures which he relates of himself are those of a paladin born in fifteen seventy nine or fifteen eighty he was at this time still a young man but already he had fought in france and in the netherlands and in transylvania against the turks he had known sea-fights and shipwrecks and had journeyed with adventures galore in italy before regal in transylvania he had challenged three turks in succession unhorsed them and cut off their heads for which doughty deed sigismund a prince of transylvania had given him a coat of arms showing three turks heads in a shield later he had been taken in battle and sold into slavery whereupon a turkish lady his master's sister had looked upon him with favour but at last he slew the turk and escaped and after wandering many days in misery came into russia here too i found as i have always done when in misfortune kindly help from a woman he wandered on into germany and thence into france and spain hearing of wars in barbary he crossed from gibraltar here he met the captain of a french man-of-war one day while he was with this man there arose a great storm which drove the ship out to sea they went before the wind to the canaries and there put themselves to rights and began to chase spanish barks 
presently they had a great fight with two spanish men-of-war in which the french ship and smith came off victors returning to morocco smith bade the french captain good-bye and took ship for england and so reached home in sixteen o four here he sought the company of like-minded men and so came upon those who had been to the new world and all their talk was of its wonders so smith joined the virginia undertaking and so we find him headed toward new adventures in the western world on sailed the three ships little ships sailing ships with a long way to go the twelfth day of february at night we saw a blazing star and presently a storm the three and twentieth day of march we fell with the island of matanenio in the west indies the four and twentieth day we anchored at dominico within fourteen degrees of the line a very fair land full of sweet and good smells inhabited by many savage indians the sixth and twentieth day we had sight of marigalanta and the next day we sailed with a slack sail alongst the isle of guadalupe we sailed by many islands as mansrat and an island called st christopher both uninhabited about two o'clock in the afternoon we anchored at the isle of mevis there the captain landed all his men we encamped ourselves on this isle six days the tenth day april we set sail and disembogued out of the west indies and bear our course northerly the sixth and twentieth day of april about four o'clock in the morning we descried the land of virginia during the long months of this voyage cramped in the three ships these men most of them young and of the hot-blooded physically adventurous sort had time to develop strong likings and dislikings the hundred and twenty split into opposed camps the several groups nursed all manner of jealousies accusations flew between like shuttlecocks the sealed box that they carried proved a manner of ate's apple all knew that seven on board were counsellors and rulers with one of the number president but they knew not which were the seven smith says that this uncertainty wrought much mischief each man of note suggesting to himself i shall be president or at least counsellor the ships became cursed with a pest of factions a prime quarrel arose between john smith and edward maria wingfield two whose temperaments seemed to have been poles apart there arose a scandalous report that smith meant to reach virginia only to usurp the government murder the council and proclaim himself king the bickering deepened into forthright quarrel with at last the expected explosion smith was arrested was put in irons and first saw virginia as a prisoner on the twenty sixth day of april sixteen o seven the susan constant the good speed and the discovery entered chesapeake bay they came in between two capes and one they named cape henry after the then prince of wales and the other cape charles for that brother of short-lived henry who was to become charles the first by cape henry they anchored and numbers from the ships went ashore but says george percy's discourse we could find nothing worth the speaking of but fair meadows and goodly tall trees with such fresh waters running through the woods as i was almost ravished at the first sight thereof at night when we were going aboard there came the savages creeping upon all four from the hills like bears with their bows in their mouths charged us very desperately in the faces hurt captain gabriel archer in both his hands and a sailor in two places of the body very dangerous after they had spent their arrows and felt the sharpness of our shot they retired into the woods with a great noise and so left us that very night by the ship's lanterns newport gosnold and ratcliffe opened the sealed box the names of the counsellors were found to be christopher newport bartholomew gosnold john ratcliffe edward maria wingfield john martin john smith and george kendall with gabriel archer for recorder from its own number at the first convenient time this council was to choose its president all this was now declared and published to all the company upon the ships john smith was given his freedom but was not yet allowed place in the council so closed an exciting day 
in the morning they pressed in parties yet further into the land but met no indians only came to a place where these savages had been roasting oysters the next day saw further exploring we marched some three or four miles further into the woods where we saw great smokes of fire we marched to those smokes and found that the savages had been there burning down the grass we passed through excellent ground full of flowers of divers kinds and colours and as goodly trees as i have seen as cedar cypress and other kinds going a little further we came into a little plat of ground full of fine and beautiful strawberries four times bigger and better than ours in england all this march we could neither see savage nor town the ships now stood into those waters which we call hampton roads finding a good channel and taking heart therefrom they named a horn of land point comfort now we call it old point comfort presently they began to go up a great river which they christened the james to english eyes it was a river hugely wide they went slowly with pauses and waitings and adventures they consulted their paper of instructions they scanned the shore for good places for their fort for their town it was may and all the rich banks were in bloom it seemed a sweet-scented world of promise they saw indians but had with these no untoward encounters upon the twelfth of may they came to a point of land which they named archer's hope landing here they saw many squirrels conies blackbirds with crimson wings and divers other fowls and birds of divers and sundry colours of crimson watchet yellow green murray and of divers other hues naturally without any art using store of turkey nests and many eggs they liked this place but for shoal water the ships could not come near to land so on they went eight miles up the river here upon the north side thirty odd miles from the mouth they came to a certain peninsula an island at high water two or three miles long less than a mile and a half in breadth at its widest place composed of marsh and woodland it ran into the river into six fathom water where the ships might be moored to the trees it was this convenient deep water that determined matters here came to anchor the susan constant the good speed and the discovery here the colonists went ashore here the members of the council were sworn and for first president was chosen edward maria wingfield here the first roaming and excitement abated they began to unlade the ships and to build the fort and also booths for their present sleeping a church too they must have at once and forthwith made it with a stretched sail for a roof and a board between two trees whereon to rest bible and book of prayer here for the first time in all this wilderness rang english acts in american forest here was english law in an english town here sounded english speech here was placed the germ of that physical mental and spiritual power which is called the united states of america end of chapter two chapter three of pioneers of the old south by mary johnston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three jamestown in historians accounts of the first months at jamestown too much perhaps has been made of faction and quarrel all this was there men set down in a wilderness amid virginian heat men mostly young of the active rather than the reflective type men uncompanioned by women and children men beset with dangers and sufferings that were soon to tax heavily their courage and patience such men naturally quarrelled and made up quarrelled again and again made up darkly suspected each the other as they darkly suspected the forest and the indian then need of friendship dominating embraced each the other felt the fascination of the forest and trusted the indian however much they suspected rebellion treacheries and desertions they practised fidelities though to varying degrees 
and there was in each man's breast more or less of courage and good intent they were prone to call one another villain but actual villainy save as jealousy suspicion and hatred are villainy seems rarely to have been present even one who was judged a villain and shot for his villainy seems hardly to have deserved such fate jamestown peninsula turned out to be feverous fantastic hopes were matched by strange fears there were homesickness incompatibilities unfamiliar food and water and air class differences in small space some petty tyrannies and very certain dangers the worst summer heat was not yet and the fort was building trees must be felled cabins raised a field cleared for planting fishing and hunting carried on and some lading some first fruits must go back in the ships no gold or rubies being as yet found they would send instead cedar and sassafras hard work enough there at jamestown in the virginian low country with may warm as northern midsummer and all the air charged with vapour from the heated river with exhalations from the rank forest from the many marshes the first night of our landing about midnight says george percy in his discourse there came some savages sailing close to our quarter presently there was an alarm given upon that the savages ran away not long after there came two savages that seemed to be commanders bravely dressed with crowns of coloured hair upon their heads which came as messengers from the werowants of pasfehe telling us that their werowants was coming and would be merry with us with a fat deer the eighteenth day the werowants of pasfehe came himself to our quarter with one hundred savages armed which guarded him in very warlike manner with bows and arrows some misunderstanding arose the werowance seeing us take to our arms went suddenly away with all his company in great anger the nineteenth day percy with several others going into the woods back of the peninsula met with a narrow path traced through the forest pursuing it they came to an indian village we stayed there a while and had of them strawberries and other things one of the savages brought us on the way to the woodside where there was a garden of tobacco and other fruits and herbs he gathered tobacco and distributed to every one of us so we departed it is evident that neither race yet knew if it was to be war or peace what the white man thought and came to think of the red man has been set down often enough there is scantier testimony as to what was the red man's opinion of the white man here imagination must be called upon newport's instructions from the london council included exploration before he should leave the colonists and bring the three ships back to england now with the pinnace and a score of men among whom was john smith he went sixty miles up the river to where the flow is broken by a world of boulders and islets to the hills crowned to-day by richmond capital of virginia the first adventurers called these rapid and whirling waters the falls of the far west to their notion they must lie at least halfway across the breadth of america misled by indian stories they believed and wrote that five or six days march from the falls of the far west even through the thick forest would bring them to the south sea the falls of the far west where at richmond the james goes with a roaring sound around tree-crowned islets it is strange to think that they once marked our frontier how that frontier has been pushed westward is a romance indeed and still to-day it is but a five or six days journey to that south sea sought by those early virginians the only condition for us is that we shall board a train to-morrow with the airship the south sea may come nearer yet the indians of this part of the earth were of the great algonquin family and the tribes with which the colonists had now to do were drawn probably by a polity based on blood ties into a loose confederation within the larger mass 
newport was told that the name of the river was powhatan the name of the chief powhatan and the name of the people powhatans but it seemed that the chief powhatan was not at this village but at another and a larger place named wero wocomoco on a second great river in the back country to the north and east of jamestown newport and his men were well entreated by the indians but yet says percy the savages murmured at our planting in the country the party did not tarry up the river back came their boat through the bright weather between the verdurous banks all green and flower-tinted save where it might be seen the brown of indian clearings with bark-covered huts and thin upcurling blue smoke before them once more rose jamestown palisaded now and riding before it the three ships and here there barked an english dog and here were englishmen to welcome englishmen both parties had news to tell but the town had most on the twenty sixth of may indians had made an attack four hundred of them with the werowants of paspahe one englishman had been killed a number wounded four of the council had each manned his wound newport must now lift anchor and sail away to england he left at jamestown a fort having three bulwarks at every corner like a half-moon and four or five pieces of artillery mounted in them a street or two of reed thatched cabins a church to match a storehouse a market-place and drill-ground and about all a stout palisade with a gate upon the river side he left corn sown and springing high and some food in the storehouse and he left a hundred englishmen who had now tasted of the country fare and might reasonably fear no worse chance than had yet befallen newport promised to return in twenty weeks with full supplies john smith says that his enemies chief amongst whom was wingfield would have sent him with newport to england there to stand trial for attempted mutiny whereupon he demanded a trial in virginia and got it and was fully cleared he now takes his place in the council before time denied him he has good words only for robert hunt the chaplain who he says went from one to the other with the best of counsel were they not all here in the wilderness together with the savages hovering about them like the philistines about the jews of old how should the english live unless among themselves they lived in amity so for the moment factions were reconciled and all went to church to partake of the holy communion newport sailed having in the holds of his ships sassafras and valuable woods but no gold to meet the london council's hopes nor any certain news of the south sea in due time he reached england and in due time he turned and came again to virginia but long was the sailing to and fro between the daughter country and the mother country and the lading and unlading at either shore it was seven months before newport came again while he sails and while england in america watches for him longingly look for a moment at the attitude of spain falling old in the procession of world powers but yet with grip and cunning left spain misliked that english new world venture she wished to keep these seas for her own only with waning energy she could not always enforce what she conceived to be her right by now there was seen to be much clay indeed in the image philip the second was dead and philip the third an indolent king lived in the escurial pedro de zuniga is the spanish ambassador to the english court he has orders from philip to keep him informed and this he does and from time to time suggests remedies he writes of newport in the first supply sire captain newport makes haste to return with some people and there have combined merchants and other persons who desire to establish themselves there because it appears to them the most suitable place that they have discovered for privateering and making attacks upon the merchant fleets of your majesty your majesty will command to see whether they will be allowed to remain there they are in a great state of excitement about that place and very much afraid lest your majesty should drive them out of it 
and there are so many who speak already of sending people to that country that it is advisable not to be too slow because they will soon be found there with large numbers of people in spain the council of state takes action upon zuniga's communications and closes a report to the king with these words the actual taking possession will be to drive out of virginia all who are there now before they are reinforced and it will be well to issue orders that the small fleet stationed to the windward which for so many years has been in state of preparation should be instantly made ready and forthwith proceed to drive out all who are now in virginia since their small numbers will make this an easy task and this will suffice to prevent them from again coming to that place upon this is made a royal note let such measures be taken in this business as may now and hereafter appear proper it would seem that there was cause indeed for watching down the river by that small small town that was all of the united states but there follows a spanish memorandum the driving out by the fleet stationed to the windward will be postponed for a long time because delay will be caused by getting it ready delay followed delay and old spain conquistador spain grew older and the speech on jamestown island is still english christopher newport was gone no ships the last refuges the last possibilities for home turning should the earth grow too hard and the sky too black rode upon the river before the fort here was the summer heat a heavy breath rose from immemorial marshes from the ancient floor of the forest when clouds gathered and storms burst they amazed the heart with their fearful thunderings and lightnings the colonists had no well but drank from the river and at neither high nor low tide found the water wholesome while the ships were here they had help of ship stores but now they must subsist upon the grain that they had in the storehouse now scant and poor enough they might fish and hunt but against such resources stood fever and inexperience and weakness and in the woods the lurking savages the heat grew greater the water worse the food less sickness began work became toil men pined from homesickness then coming together quarrelled with a weak violence then dropped away again into corners and sat listlessly with hanging heads the sixth of august there died john aspie of the bloody flicks the ninth day died george flower of the swelling the tenth day died william bruster gentleman of a wound given by the savages the fourteenth day jerome alacoc ancient died of a wound the same day francis midwinter edward morris corporal died suddenly the fifteenth day there died edward brown and stephen galthorpe the sixteenth day there died thomas gower gentleman the seventeenth day there died thomas mounsley the eighteenth day there died robert pennington and john martin gentleman the nineteenth day died drew pigas gentleman the two and twentieth day of august there died captain bartholomew gosnold one of our council he was honourably buried having all the ordnance in the fort shot off with many volleys of small shot the four and twentieth day died edward harrington and george walker and were buried the same day the sixth and twentieth day died canelm throgmorton the seven and twentieth day died william roods the eighth and twentieth day died thomas studi cape merchant the fourth day of september died thomas jacob sergeant the fifth day there died benjamin beast extreme misery makes men blind unjust and weak of judgment here was gross wretchedness and the colonists proceeded to blame a and b and c lost altogether in the wilderness it was this counsellor or that counsellor this ambitious one or that one this or that almost certainly ascertained traitor wanting to steal the pinnace the one craft left by newport wanting to steal away in the pinnace and leave the mast small enough mast now without boat or raft or straw to cling to made the favourite accusation upon this count early in september wingfield was deposed from the presidency ratcliffe succeeded him but presently ratcliffe fared no better one counsellor fared worse for george kendall accused of plotting mutiny and pinnace stealing was given trial found guilty and shot the eighteenth day of september died one ellis kiniston the same day at night died one richard simmons the nineteenth day there died one thomas mooton what went on in virginia in the indian mine can only be conjectured 
as little as the white mind could it foresee the trend of events or the ultimate outcome of present policy there was exhibited a seesaw policy or perhaps no policy at all only the emotional fit as it came hot or cold the friendly act trod upon the hostile the hostile upon the friendly through the miserable summer the hostile was uppermost then with the autumn appeared the friendly mood fortunate enough for the most feeble wretches at jamestown indians came laden with maize and venison the heat was a thing of the past cool embracing weather appeared and with it great flocks of wild fowl swans geese ducks and cranes famine vanished sickness decreased the dead were dead of the hundred and four persons left by newport less than fifty had survived but these may be thought of as indeed seasoned End of chapter 3chapter four of pioneers of the old south by mary johnston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four john smith with the cool weather began active exploration the object in chief the gathering from the indians by persuasion or trade or show of force food for the approaching winter here john smith steps forward as leader there begins a string of adventures of that hardy and romantic individual how much in smith's extant narrations is exaggeration how much is dispossession of others merits in favour of his own it is difficult to say a thing that one little likes is his persistent depreciation of his fellows there is but one noble adventurer and that one is john smith on the other hand evident enough are his courage and initiative his ingenuity and his rough practical sagacity let us take him at something less than his own valuation but yet as valuable enough as for his adventures real or fictitious one may see in them epitomized the adventures of many and many men english french spanish dutch blazers of the material path for the present civilization in december rather autumn than winter in this region he starts with the shallop and a handful of men up a tributary river that they have learned to call the chickahominy he is going for corn but there is also an idea that he may hear news of that wished-for south sea the chickahominy proved itself a wonder land of swamp and tree-choked streams somewhere up its checkered reaches smith left the shallop with men to guard it and taking two of the party with two indian guides went on in a canoe up a narrower way presently those left with the boat incautiously go ashore and are attacked by indians one is taken tortured and slain the others get back to their boat and so away down the chickahominy and into the now somewhat familiar james but smith with his two men robinson and emery are now alone in the wilderness up among narrow waters brown marshes fallen and obstructing tree trunks now come the men hunting indians the king of pamonk says smith with two hundred bowmen robinson and emery are shot full of arrows smith is wounded but with his musket deters the foe killing several of the savages his eyes upon them he steps backward hoping he may beat them off till he shall recover the shallop but meets with the ill chance of a boggy and icy stream into which he stumbles and here is taken see him now before opekenkanoff king of pamonk savages and procedures of the more civilized with savages have the world over a family resemblance like many a man before him and after smith casts about for a propitiatory wonder he has with him so fortunately a round ivory double compass dial this with a genial manner he would present to opekenkanoff the savage's gaze cannot touch through the glass the moving needle grunt their admiration smith proceeds with gestures and what indian words he knows to deliver a scientific lecture talking is best anyhow will give them less time in which to think of those men he shot 
he tells them that the world is round and discourses about the sun and moon and stars and the alternation of day and night he speaks with eloquence of the nations of the earth of white men yellow men black men and red men of his own country and its grandeurs and would explain antipodes apparently all is waste breath and of no avail for in an hour see him bound to a tree a sturdy figure of a man bearded and moustached with a high forehead clad in shirt and jerkin and breeches and hosen and shoon all by this time we may be sure profoundly in need of repair the tree and smith are ringed by indians each of whom has an arrow fitted to his bow almost one can hear a knell ringing in the forest but o peckin canoff moved by the compass or willing to hear more of seventeenth-century science raises his arm and stops the execution unbinding smith they take him with them as a trophy presently all reach their town of orapox here he was kindly treated he saw indian dances heard indian orations the women and children pressed about him and admired him greatly bread and venison were given him in such quantity that he feared that they meant to fatten and eat him it is moreover dangerous to be considered powerful where one is scarcely so a young indian lay mortally ill and they took smith to him and demanded that forthwith he be cured if the white man could kill how they were not able to see he could likewise doubtless restore life but the indian presently died his father crying out in fury fell upon the stranger who could have done so much and would not here also coolness saved the white man smith was now led in triumph from town to town through the winter woods the james was behind him the chickahominy also he was upon new great rivers the pamunkey and the rappahannock all the villages were much alike alike the still woods the sere patches from which the corn had been taken the bear the deer the foxes the turkeys that were met with the countless wild fowl everywhere were the same curious crowding savages the fires the rustic cookery the covering skins of deer and fox and otter the oratory the ceremonial dances the manipulations of medicine men or priests these last to the englishmen pure devils with antique tricks days were consumed in this going from place to place at one point was produced a bag of gunpowder gained in some way from jamestown it was being kept with care to go into the earth in the spring and produce when simmer came some wonderful crop opekanakanoff was a great chief but higher than he moved powhatan chief of chiefs this indian was yet a stranger to the english in virginia now john smith was to make his acquaintance werowocomoco stood upon a bluff on the north side of york river here came smith and his captors around them the winter woods before them the broad blue river again the gathered indians men and women again the staring the handling the more or less uncomplimentary remarks then into the indian ceremonial lodge he was pushed here sat the chief of chiefs powhatan and he had on a robe of raccoon skins with all the tails hanging about him sat his chief men and behind these were gathered women all were painted head and shoulders all wore bound about the head adornments meant to strike with beauty or with terror all had chains of beads smith does not report what he said to powhatan or powhatan to him he says that the queen of apomatuck brought him water for his hands and that there was made a great feast when this was over the indians held a council it ended in a death decree incontinently smith was seized dragged to a great stone lying before powhatan forced down and bound the indians made ready their clubs meaning to batter his brains out then says smith occurred the miracle a child of powhatan's a very young girl called pocahontas sprang from among the women ran to the stone and with her own body sheltered that of the englishman what in powhatan's mind of hesitation wiliness or good nature backed his daughter's plea is not known but smith did not have his brains beaten out he was released taken by some form of adoption into the tribe and set to using those same brains in the making of hatchets and ornaments a few days passed and he was yet further enlarged powhatan longed for two of the great guns possessed by the white men and for a grindstone 
he would send smith back to jamestown if in return he was sure of getting those treasures it is to be supposed that smith promised him guns and grindstones as many as could be borne away so werowocomoco saw him depart twelve indians for escort he had leagues to go a night or two to spend upon the march lying in the huge winter woods he expected on the whole death before morning but almighty god mollified the hearts of those stern barbarians with compassion and so he was restored to jamestown where he found more dead than when he left some there undoubtedly welcomed him as a strong man restored when there was need of strong men others it seems would as lief that pocahontas had not interfered the indians did not get their guns and grindstones but smith loaded a demi culverin with stones and fired upon a great tree icicle hung the gun roared the boughs broke the ice fell rattling the smoke spread the indians cried out and cowered away guns and grindstones smith told them were too violent and heavy devils for them to carry from river to river instead he gave them from the trading store gifts enticing to the savage eye and not susceptible of being turned against the donors here at jamestown in midwinter were more food and less mortal sickness than in the previous fearful summer yet no great amount of food and now suffering too from bitter cold nor had the sickness ended nor dissensions less than fifty men were all that held together england and america a frayed cord the last strands of which might presently part then up the river comes christopher newport in the francis and john to be followed some weeks later by the phoenix here is new life stores for the settlers and a hundred new virginians how certain at any rate is the exchange of talk of home and hair-raising stories of this wilderness between the old colonists and the new and certain is the relief and the renewed hopes morning turns to joy even a conflagration that presently destroys the major part of the town cannot blast that felicity again newport and smith and others went out to explore the country they went over to werowocomoco and talked with powhatan he told them things which they construed to mean that the south sea was near at hand and they marked this down as good news for the home council still impatient for gold and cathay on their return to jamestown they found under way new and stouter houses the indians were again friendly they bought venison and turkeys and corn smith says that every few days came pocahontas and attendant women bringing food spring came again with the dogwood and the honeysuckle and the strawberries the gay returning birds the barred and striped and mottled serpents the colony was one year old back to england sailed the francis and john and the phoenix carrying home edward maria wingfield who has wearied of virginia and will return no more what rests certain and praiseworthy in smith is his thoroughness and daring in exploration this summer he went with fourteen others down the river in an open boat and so across the great bay wide as a sea to what is yet called the eastern shore the counties now of accomac and northampton rounding cape charles these indefatigable explorers came upon islets beaten by the atlantic surf these they named smith's islands landing upon the main shore they met grim and stout savages who took them to the king of accomac and him they found civil enough this side of the great bay with every creek and inlet smith examined and set down upon the map he was making even if he could find no gold for the council at home at least he would know what places were suited for harbours and habitations soon a great storm came up and they landed again met yet other indians went farther and were in straits for fresh water the weather became worse they were in danger of shipwreck had to bail the boat continually indians gathered upon the shore and discharged flights of arrows but were dispersed by a volley from the muskets the bread the english had with them went bad wind and weather were adverse three or four of the fifteen fell ill but recovered the weather improved they came to the seven mile wide mouth of patawomec the potomac they turned their boat up this vast stream for a long time they saw upon the woody banks no savages then without warning they came upon ambuscades of great numbers so strangely painted grimed and disguised shouting yelling and crying as we rather suppose them so many devils 
smith in midstream ordered musket fire and the balls went grazing over the water and the terrible sound echoed through the woods the savages threw down their bows and arrows and made signs of friendliness the english went ashore hostages were exchanged and a kind of amicableness ensued after such sylvan entertainment smith and his men returned to the boat the oars dipped and rose the bright water broke from them and these englishmen in old virginia proceeded up the potomac could they have seen could they but have seen before them on the north bank rising like the unsubstantial fabric of a dream there above the trees a vast white capital shining in the sunlight far up the river they noticed that the sand on the shore gleamed with yellow spangles they looked and saw high rocks and they thought that from these the rain had washed the glittering dust gold harbors they had found but what of gold what even of cathay going downstream they sought again those friendly indians did they know gold or silver the indians looked wise nodded heads and took the visitors up a little tributary river to a rocky hill in which with shells and hatchets they had opened as it were a mine here they gathered a mineral which when powdered they sprinkled over themselves and their idols making them says the relation like blackamoors dusted over with silver the white men filled their boat with as much of this ore as they could carry high were their hopes over it but when it was subsequently sent to london and essayed it was found to be worthless the fifteen now started homeward out of potomac and down the westward side of chesapeake in their travels they saw besides the indians all manner of four-footed virginians bears rolled their bulk through these forests deer went whither they would the explorers might meet foxes and catamounts otter beaver and marten raccoon and opossum wolf and indian dog winged virginians made the forests vocal the owl hooted at night and the whippoorwill called in the twilight the streams were filled with fish coming to the mouth of the rappahannock the traveller's boat grounded upon sand with the tide at ebb awaiting the water that should lift them off the fifteen began with their swords to spear the fish among the reeds smith had the ill luck to encounter a stingray and received its barbed weapon through his wrist there set in a great swelling and torment which made him fear that death was at hand he ordered his funeral and a grave to be dug on a neighbouring islet yet by degrees he grew better and so out of torment and withal so hungry that he longed for supper whereupon with a light heart he had his late enemy the stingray cooked and ate him they then named the place stingray island and the tide serving got off the sandbar and down the bay and so came home to jamestown having been gone seven weeks like ulysses smith refuses to rest in inaction a few days and away he is again first up to rappahannock and then across the bay on this journey he and his men come up with the giant susquehannocks who are not algonquins but iroquois after many hazards in which the forest and the savage play their part smith and his band again return to jamestown in all this adventuring they have gained much knowledge of the country and its inhabitants but yet no gold and no further news of the south sea or of far cathay it was now september and the second summer with its toll of fever victims was well nigh over autumn and renewed energy were at hand all the land turned crimson and gold a jamestown building went forward together with the gathering of ripened crops the felling of trees fishing and fowling and trading for indian corn and turkeys one day george percy heading a trading party down the river saw coming toward him a white sailed ship the mary and margaret it was christopher newport again with the second supply seventy colonists came over on the mary and margaret among them a fair number of men of note here were captain peter wynne and richard waldo old soldiers and valiant gentlemen francis west young brother of the lord de la war raleigh crashaw john codrington daniel tucker and others this is indeed an important ship among the labourers the london council had sent eight poles and germans skilled in their own country in the production of pitch tar glass and soap ashes here then began in virginia other blood strains than the english and in the mary and margaret comes with master thomas forrest his wife mistress forrest and her maid by name anne burris 
apart from those lost ones of raleigh's colony at roanoke these are the first english women in virginia there may be guessed what welcome they got how much was made of them christopher newport had from that impatient london council somewhat strange orders he was not to return without a lump of gold or a certain discovery of waters pouring into the south sea or some notion gained of the fate of the lost colony of roanoke he had been given a barge which could be taken to pieces and so borne around those falls of the far west then put together and the voyage to the pacific resumed moreover he had for powhatan whom the mines at home figured as a sort of asiatic despot a gilt crown and a fine ewer and basin a bedstead and a gorgeous robe the easiest task that of delivering powhatan's present and placing an idle crown upon that indian's head who among his own people was already sufficiently supreme might be and was performed and newport with a large party went again to the falls of the far west and miles deep into the country beyond here they found indians outside the powhatan confederacy but no south sea nor mines of gold and silver nor any news of the lost colony of roanoke in december newport left virginia in the mary and margaret and with him sailed ratcliffe smith succeeded to the presidency about this time john laden a laborer and ann burris that maid of mistress Forrest, fell in love and were married so came about the first english wedding in virginia winter followed with snow and ice nigh two hundred people to feed and not overmuch in the larder with which to do it smith with george percy and francis west and others went again to the indians for corn christmas found them weather-bound at kikatan wherever an englishman may be and in whatever part of the world he must keep christmas with feasting and merriment and indeed we were never more merry nor fed on more plenty of good oysters fish flesh wild fowl and good bread nor never had better fires in england than in the dry smoky houses of kikatan but despite this christmas fair there soon began quarrels many and intricate with powhatan and his brother opekenkanoff end of chapter four chapter five of pioneers of the old south by mary johnston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five the sea adventure experience is a great teacher that london company with virginia to colonize had now come to see how inadequate to the attempt were its means and strength it might be long before either gold mines or the south sea could be found the company's ships were too slight and few colonists were going by the single handful when they should go by the double something was at fault in the management of the enterprise the quarrels in virginia were too constant the disasters too frequent more money more persons interested with purse and mind a great company instead of a small a national caste to the enterprise these were imperative needs in the press of such demands the london company passed away in sixteen hundred and nine under new letters patent was born the virginia company the members and shareholders in this corporation touched through and through the body of england at that day first names upon the roll come robert cecil thomas howard henry ryothesley william herbert henry clinton richard sackville thomas cecil philip herbert earls of salisbury suffolk southampton pembroke lincoln dorset exeter and montgomery then follow a dozen peers the lord bishop of bath and wells a hundred knights many gentlemen one hundred and ten merchants certain physicians and clergymen old soldiers of the continental wars sea captains and mariners and a small host of the unclassified in addition shares were taken by fifty-six london guilds or industrial companies here are the companies of the tallow and wax chandlers the armourers and girdlers cord wainers and carpenters masons plumbers bounders poulterers cooks coopers tilers and bricklayers boyers and vinters merchant tailors blacksmiths and weavers mercers grocers turners gardeners dyers scriveners 
fruiterers plasterers brown bakers embroiderers musicians and many more the first council appointed by the new charter had fifty-two members fourteen of whom sat in the english house of lords and twice that number in the commons thus was virginia well linked to crown and parliament this great commercial company had sovereign powers within virginia the king should have his fifth part of all or of gold and silver the laws and religion of england should be upheld and no man let go to virginia who had not first taken the oath of supremacy but in the wide field beside all this the president called the treasurer and the council henceforth to be chosen out of and by the whole body of subscribers had full sway no longer should there be a second council sitting in virginia but a governor with power answerable only to the company at home that company might tax and legislate within the virginian field punish the ill-doer or rebel and wage war if need be against indian or spaniard one of the first actions of the newly constituted body was to seek remedy for the customary passage by way of the west indies so long and so beset by dangers they sent forth a small ship under captain samuel argall with instructions to attempt a direct and clear passage by leaving the canaries to the east and from thence to run a straight western course and so to make an experience of the winds and currents which have affrighted all undertakers by the north this argall a young man with a stirring and adventurous life behind him and before him took his ship the indicated way he made the voyage in nine weeks of which two were spent becalmed and upon his return reported that it might be made in seven and no apparent inconvenience in the way he brought to the great council of the company a story of necessity and distress at jamestown and the council lays much of the blame for that upon the misgovernment of the commanders by dissension and ambition among themselves and upon the idleness of the general run active in nothing but adhering to factions and parts the council sitting afar from a savage land is probably much too severe but the factions and parts cannot easily be denied before argall's return the company had commissioned as governor of virginia sir thomas gates and had gathered a fleet of seven ships and two pinnaces with sir george somers as admiral in the ship called the sea adventure and christopher newport as vice-admiral all weighed anchor from falmouth early in june and sailed by the newly tried course south to the canaries and then across these seven ships carried five hundred colonists men women and children on st james's day there rose and broke a fearsome storm two days and nights it raged and it scattered that fleet of seven gates somers and newport with others of rank and quality were upon the sea adventure how fared this ship with one attendant pinnace we shall come to see presently but the other ships driven to and fro at last found a favourable wind and in august they sighted virginia on the eleventh of that month they came storm-beaten and without governor or admiral or sea adventure into our bay and at last to the king's river and town here there swarmed from these ships nigh three hundred persons meeting and met by the hundred dwelling at jamestown this was the third supply but it lacked the hundred or so upon the sea adventure and the pinnace and it lacked a head being put ashore without their governor or any order from him all the commissioners and principal persons being aboard him no man would acknowledge a superior with this multitude appeared once more in virginia the three ancient councillors ratcliffe archer and martin apparently here came fresh fuel for factions who should rule and who should be ruled here is an extremely old and important question settled in history only to be unsettled again everywhere it rises dust on time's road and is laid only to rise again smith was still president who was in the right and who in the wrong in these ancient quarrels the recital of which fills the pages of smith and of other men is hard now to be determined but jamestown became a place of turbulence francis west was sent with a considerable number to the falls of the far west to make there some kind of settlement for a like purpose martin and percy were dispatched to the nansmund river all along the line there was bitter falling out the indians became markedly hostile smith was up the river quarrelling with west and his men at last he called them wrong-headed asses flung himself into his boat 
and made down the river to jamestown yet even so he found no peace for while he was asleep in the boat by some accident or other a spark found its way to his powder pouch the powder exploded terribly hurt he leaped overboard into the river whence he was with difficulty rescued smith was now deposed by ratcliffe archer and martin because being an ambitious unworthy and vainglorious fellow say his detractors he would rule all and engross all authority into his own hands be this as it may smith was put on board one of the ships which were about to sail for england wounded and with none at jamestown able to heal his hurt he was no unwilling passenger thus he departed and virginia knew captain john smith no more some liked him and his ways some liked him not nor his ways either he wrote of his own deeds and praised them highly and saw little good in other mankind though here and there he made an exception evident enough are faults of temper but he had great courage and energy and at times a lofty disinterestedness again winter drew on at jamestown and with it misery on misery george percy now president lay ill and unable to keep order the multitude unbridled and heedless pulled this way and that before the cold had well begun what provision there was in the storehouse became exhausted that stream of corn from the indians in which the colonists had put dependence failed to flow the indians themselves began systematically to spoil and murder ratcliffe and fourteen with him met death while loading his barge with corn upon the pamunkey the cold grew worse by midwinter there was famine the four hundred already noticeably dwindled dwindled fast and faster the cold was severe the indians were in the woods the weakened bodies of the white men pined and shivered they broke up the empty houses to make fires to warm themselves they began to die of hunger as well as by indian arrows on went the winter and every day some died tales of cannibalism are told this was the starving time when the leaves were red and gold england in america had a population of four hundred and more when the dogwood and the strawberry bloomed england and america had a population of but sixty somewhat later than this time there came from the pen of shakespeare a play dealing with a tempest and shipwreck and a magical isle and rescue thereon the bright spirit ariel speaks of the still vexed bermoothes these were islands two hundred leagues from any continent named after a spanish captain bermudas who had landed there once there had been indians but these the spaniards had slain or taken as slaves now the islands were desolate uninhabited forlorn and unfortunate chance vessels might touch but the approach was dangerous there grew rumours of pirates and then of demons the isles of demons was the name given to them the most forlorn and unfortunate place in the world was the description that fitted them in those distant days all torment trouble wonder and amazement inhabits here some heavenly power guide us out of this fearful country when shakespeare so wrote there was news in england and talk went to and fro of the shipwreck of the sea adventure upon the rocky teeth of the vermouthies uninhabitable and almost inaccessible and of the escape and dwelling there for months at gates and summers and the colonists in that ship it is generally assumed that this incident furnished timber for the framework of the tempest the storm that broke on st james's day scattering the ships of the third supply drove the sea adventure here and there at will upon her watch gates and summers and newport above a hundred men and a few women and children there sprang a leak all thought of death then rose a cry land ho the storm abated but the wind carried the sea adventure upon this shore and grounded her upon a reef a certain r rich gentleman one of the voyagers made and published a ballad upon the whole event if it is hardly shakespearean music yet it is not devoid of interest the seas did rage the winds did blow distressed were they then their ship did leak her tacklings break in danger were her men but heaven was pilot in this storm and to an island near vermouthaw's call conducted them which did abate their fear using the ship's boats they got to shore though with toil and danger here they found no sprites nor demons nor even men but a fair half tropical verdure and running wild great numbers of swine and then on shore the island came inhabited by hogs some foul and tortoise there were they only had one dog to kill these swine to yield them food that little had to eat their store was spent and all things scant alas they wanted meat they did not however starve 
a thousand hogs that dog did kill their hunger to sustain ten months the virginia colonists lived among the still vexed bermoothes the sea adventure was but a wreck pinned between the reefs no sail was seen upon the blue water where they were thrown there gates and summers and newport and all must stay for a time and make the best of it they builded huts and thatched them and they brought from the wrecked ship pinned but half a mile from land stores of many kinds the clime proved of the blandest fairest with fishing and hunting they maintained themselves days weeks and months went by they had a minister master buck they brought from the ship a bell and raised it for a church bell a marriage a few deaths the births of two children these were events on the island one of these children the daughter of john rolfe gentleman and his wife was christened bermuda gates and summers held kindly sway the colonists lived in plenty peace and ease but for all that they were shipwrecked folk and far far out of the world and they longed for the old ways and their own kin day followed day but no sail would show to bear them thence and so at last taking what they could from the forests of the island and from the sea adventure they set about to become shipwrights and there two gallant pinnaces did build of cedar tree the brave deliverance one was called of seventy ton was she the other patience had to name her burthen thirty ton the two and forty weeks being past they hoist sail and away their ships with hogs well freighted were their hearts with mickle joy and so to virginia came what they found when they came to virginia was doler enough on jamestown strand they beheld sixty skeletons who had eaten all the quick things that were there and some of them had eaten snakes and adders summers gates and newport on entering the town found it rather as the ruins of some ancient fortification than that any people living might now inhabit it a pitiable outcome this of all the hopes of fair harbours and habitations of golden dreams and far-flung dominion all those whom raleigh had sent to roanoke were lost or had perished those who had named and had first dwelled in jamestown were in number about a hundred to these had been added during the first year or so perhaps two hundred more and the ships that had parted from the sea adventure had brought in three hundred first and last not far from seven hundred english folk had come to live in virginia and these skeletons eating snakes and adders were all that remained of that company all those others had died miserably and their hopes were ashes with them what might sir thomas gates the governor do that which added most to his sorrow and not a little startled him was the impossibility how to amend one whit of this his forces were not of ability to revenge upon the indian nor his own supply now brought from the bermudas sufficient to relieve his people so he called a council and listened in turn to sir george somers to christopher newport and to the gentlemen and consul of the former government the end and upshot was that none could see other course than to abandon the country england in america had tried and failed and had tried again and failed god or the course of nature or the current of history was against her perhaps in time stronger forces and other attempts might yet issue from england but now the hour had come to say farewell upon the bosom of the river swung two pinnaces the discovery and the virginia left by the departing ships months before and the deliverance and the patience the bermuda pinnaces thus the english abandoned the little town that was but three years old aboard the four small ships they went and down the broad river between the flowery shores they sailed away doubtless under the trees on either hand were indians watching this retreat of the invaders of their forests the plan of the departing colonists was to turn north when they had reached the sea and make for newfoundland where they might perhaps meet with english fishing ships so they sailed down the river and doubtless many hearts were heavy and sad but others doubtless were full of joy and thankfulness to be going back to an older home than virginia the river broadened toward chesapeake and then before them what did they see what deliverance for those who had held on to the uttermost they saw the long boat of an english ship coming toward them with flashing oars bringing news of comfort and relief there indeed off point comfort lay three ships the de la war the blessing and the hercules and they brought with a good company and good stores sir thomas west lord de la war appointed over gates lord governor and captain-general by land and sea of the colony of virginia the discovery the virginia the patience and the deliverance thereupon put back to that shore they thought to have left forever 
two days later on sunday the tenth of june sixteen ten there anchored before jamestown the de la war the blessing and the hercules and it was thus that the new lord governor wrote home i in the afternoon went ashore where after a sermon made by mr buck i caused my commission to be read upon which sir thomas gates delivered up unto me his own commission both patents and the council's seal and then i delivered some few words unto the company and after did constitute and give place of office and charge to divers captains and gentlemen and elected unto me a council the dead was alive again saith rich's ballad and to the adventurers thus he writes be not dismayed at all for scandal cannot do us wrong god will not let us fall let england know our willingness for that our work is good we hope to plant a nation where none before hath stood End of chapter 5